Our lecture today is going to be on modern art, and I'm going to walk you through all the modern art movements from Impressionism, which begins in the 1860s and 1870s, all the way to Abstract Expressionism in the 1940s and 50s. This lecture is not intended as a supplement for a course on modern art. It is just simply walking you through the different art movements, showing you how to recognize them, telling you some of the artists that are involved, and also showing the application of the formal elements, which we've been learning about in this course, and how they're affected by the evolution of modern art. So one of the first questions we have to ask ourselves is, when does the modern art movement begin? And the answer is going to be, well, it depends who you talk to. Most of us, many of us, I should say, look at the invention of photography as the doorway opening into modern art. Others will argue that it is Jacques-Louis David back during the French Revolution. And some people even argue that modern art begins with Giotto at the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. But I think it begins much, much more closer to our current date. The invention of photography happens in 1839, and we'll have an entire lecture on that later on in the semester. When it's invented, it becomes a mania. But also, all of a sudden, no one needs an artist anymore to replicate that world. We talked about the roles of the artist, and this revolves very heavily around the second role of the artist. Artists document the world. Well, all of a sudden, we have photography that can do that easier, cheaper, and more accurate. So in order for art to survive, it needs to change or transform into something different. And in the lecture we just had, we talked about Edward Manet, and I let you know that he was the father of modern art. He broke a lot of the rules that had been established in painting that date back to the early to mid Renaissance. His landmark work, Luncheon on the Grass, kicked out of the Salon of 1863 because it broke so many of those traditional rules. But we also look back on this work as, again, that pinnacle moment in art where we move into modernism. So the artist Manet has a following of young artists that would hang out with him at the Café Garbois on the right bank of the Seine in Paris. And they were called Manet's Circle. These individuals are going to become the Impressionists, and the Impressionists are the very first secessionist art movement. The leader of the Impressionists, his name is Claude Monet. And that's him there. And this is probably one of the few photographs you'll see of him without a cigarette in his hand. He was very much a chain smoker. And if this image was not in black and white, you could see the nicotine stains on his beard. So the things we need to know about Impressionism, of course, is how can we identify a work as Impressionist? And what type of subject matter are we going to be looking at? The answer is Impressionist paintings are characterized by short, quick, visible brushstrokes that captures the elements of light. There's a certain sketch-like quality about these works. And overall, we can describe these paintings as being bright and colorful. So this is an example of an Impressionist work. And when we zoom in to the different details of the work, we can see that it almost looks like just splotches of color, almost chicken scratch with some of those lines. But when we zoom out from it, it makes a coherent image. There's also going to be no religious scenes or paintings with heavy subject matter. These are scenes of people at rest, at leisure, playing, dancing, or vacationing at the beach. The paintings give us a glimpse into what life was like in Paris in the late 19th century, and I think for most of us we can say that these paintings are really beautiful. In fact, Claude Monet had sometimes been referred to as the painter of happiness. 
And again, this work shows us that type of heavy, broad, visible brush strokes that is so prevalent in Impressionist paintings. Here's also where we include that perceptual or optical color that we talked about earlier in the semester in our chapter on color. And what is the theory behind it? We need to know that um, this is the color art is, or an object is, at any particular moment in time. We also need to think about the term on plain air. So once again, perceptual or optical color, that's the color our eyes perceive the object to be at that particular moment. Our idea that color is derived from light and light changes throughout the day. Therefore, color has to change as well. So in 1666, Sir Isaac Newton refracts light through a prism and we find that it emerges into six specific colors and those colors were called the hues. And of course, we see it on the cover of Pink Floyd's album. And those six colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And those colors are also the primary and secondary colors. Grain stack in the morning, this is perceptual color. The idea of not even thinking about painting a grain stack, but painting light's effect on it. And of course, Monet paints this multiple times. The same with cathedral fronts and also the Houses of Parliament. On plein air is when we have artists that take their easels and paints outside and paint in front of the object they're working on. They're not working in a studio. And when we look at this time period of the 1860s, to do this was very innovative and revolutionary. And so this is someone painting on plein air. The Impressionists also staged their own exhibitions away from the salon. And you should know a rough idea of how many there were and if they were successful or not. I mean, these guys are trying something new. In total, there's going to be eight Impressionist exhibitions. The artist Pizarro is the only artist to exhibit in all of them. And unfortunately, they were failures, both in attendance and financially. So when you have a salon, normally 400,000 people walk through it every year or every season. For the Impressionist exhibitions, only about 4,000 people, so about 1%. People did not like Impressionism when it was first introduced, and it kind of scared some people because these paintings were so different. In this cartoon, we have this police officer keeping this pregnant woman out of the Impressionist exhibition because he felt it would the sight of these paintings would harm her unborn child. So Claude Monet is the leader of the Impressionists, and he is one of the few artists that we see that actually sees his own fame. Um, this is a, a person who rises to prominence in the 1860s and is going to be a famous painter for the next 60 years. Impressionism first caught on in America, and you could not be a rich American industrialist without a fine art collection that included a painting of Monet. Mrs. Potter Palmer was the wealthiest woman in Chicago, and this is her mansion here. When you go into her living room, you can see on the far right-hand side, we have one of Monet's grain stack paintings. Monet also lived on an estate in Giverny. He when he first moved here, he rented it out, but after about four years, he had earned enough money to buy it outright. He also employed four full-time gardeners to maintain his estate. What we don't really recognize a lot of times is that Monet wasn't just a painter. 
I mean, he was a really cool guy. He loved horticulture and he also loved cars. He was a car nut. And not only did he have a studio for painting, but he also had a garage where he housed his collection of cars. So he was kind of like the Jay Leno of his age. And he also is uh, in the history books for getting the very first speeding ticket in the city of Giverny. This is a person who rerouted tributaries so that he would have a stream going through his estate in which to plant his famous water lily ponds. This really upset a lot of the farmers who were downstream from him because at the time water lilies were something that was very exotic and we didn't know a whole lot about them and there were rumors that these could possibly be poisoning the water that downstream the livestock would be drinking from. But of course this is not true. Toward his later career, this is when he created the water lily paintings. And you'll also notice here that there's no horizon line to look at. And these paintings, although the subject matter is something that you would look down upon, these paintings are up on the wall. So it gives us kind of a very different sensation. And of course, the way he has this created is that we are basically surrounded by art. Monet does have a really good quote. He says that when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, a tree, a house, or whatever. Merely think here is a little square of blue, an oblong of pink, a streak of yellow, and paint just as it looks to you, the exact color and shape, until it gives your own naive impression of the scene before you. And especially when we look at a painting like this by Monet, those statements add really true because this is what he is just creating, a very rough sketch of these different colors. And even in the x-ray, we can see the brush strokes that he's creating. Other famous impressionists would be like Camille Pizarro, who was really the person who served as a mentor to many of the young artists. Tremendous amount of his work is going to be landscapes and also some city scenes. August Renoir, the painter of light, that's where we get this painting from. And what's great about Renoir is that the individuals that he depicts are all individuals that are recognizable. Off to the left is his girlfriend who he's going to end up marrying and she's playing with their dog. His brother stands behind her and on the right hand side the very first gentleman is like a neighbor who lived across the street from him. So these are all like recognizable individuals. And once again, think about the subject matter. These are happy scenes. This is a dance hall on a Sunday afternoon. Mary Casada is unique. Not only is she one of the female impressionists, and there were several, but also she was American. And she grew up in Pennsylvania, went to the Pittsburgh School of Fine Arts. But here in America, we were still painting and teaching the very uh, technical academic aspects of art and she had heard about this avant-garde impressionist movement and she went to France and joined them. Most of her subject matters are very intimate portraits of mother and child or siblings and again you can see how the very sketch-like quality of this work really kind of shows through to the spontaneousness of the moment. One of the nicknames that the Impressionists had were the Sketchers, and that was very much a derogatory term. Those that completed work by the academic standard, those were called the Finishers. Edgar Degas also falls into this category, even though he absolutely hated being called an Impressionist but that's what he was. We talked earlier on about how the idea of having a cropped image such as this helps to portray the illusion of motion. And this is what he's noted for, is breaking down the idea that 
the inside of the painting, the subject matter happened in the past. It really is about the present. And that's why we have her arm and part of her dress on the other side of the frame into our world. Again, a very modernist point of view. Many of the techniques that Degas invents using pastels, which is what this work is created with, are still in practice today, still being taught today. Like so many of the Impressionists, Degas is going to go blind toward the end of his life. Mary Cassatt goes blind. Camille Pizarro goes blind. Ma uh, Monet, he uh, develops cataracts and also has a difficult time seeing. But what happens that's different with Degas is that he just changes medium, going from painting and drawing to sculpture. Many of these cast well after his death in the mid 20th century. Now we're gonna move on to post-impressionism. And post-impressionists are not the next generation of painters, but they are definitely later contemporaries. This group of artists is not interested in perceptual color. They are interested in the expressive use of color. And they're also interested with the depiction of spatial planes, as we'll see in the works of Cezanne. But what's unique is that none of these artists would have ever heard the term post-impressionist because it was coined well after the last one passed away which would have been Cezanne in like 1906. So the famous art historian Roger Fry comes along in 1919 and he separates this group of artists out because their aims are different. Seurat would have been the leader of the post-impressionists but he dies very young around the age of 31, 32, from a respiratory illness. He is interested in color theory, and he is the one who developed pointillism, which we talked about in the color chapter, the idea of not mixing paint in the traditional way, but using a dot of blue next to a dot of yellow to create the color sensation of green. So he has a huge interest in experimenting with color theory. And that's what we have to think about. The, really, the entire modern art movement is about experimentation, and particularly scientific experimentation. There is definitely a tie-in with art and science, and particularly physics. So Cezanne is noted as the father, or in Picasso's case, as the mother of 20th century art. Not of modern art, but just of 20th century art, because he's going to be responsible for leading us into both Fauvism and Cubism with some of his paintings. He did apply to the School of Fine Arts in Paris, but was turned down. He did go to the Academy Suisse, which is named after Charles Suisse. And his father actually wanted him to be a banker, but he pursued art instead. So with this painting here, it is a normal still life that we would commonly see depicted of like everyday objects. But Cezanne's still life is so different because he's painting it from different points of view. When we look at the left hand side of the image, we see the table kind of lower than it is off to the right. We have a wine bottle that looks like it's tipping over. We have apples looking like they're going to fall off the table. So we're eliminating the idea, once again, of linear perspective, making this work very flat. And so this is really more focused towards spatial planes. In the Great Bathers, we see a use of arbitrary color. And this is going to lead us to Fauvism. Paul Gauguin, he falls into this classification. We're going to learn more about him during the lecture on Van Gogh, if you haven't already listened to that lecture already. But he was a roommate of Paul of uh, Vincent Van Gogh during his uh, time in Arles, which is in the south of France. He's going to end up spending the last 12 years of his life uh, in Tahiti, painting images of natives such as this one. And this is one of the 10 most expensive paintings ever purchased at auction. 
and I thought it would be a good time to take a look at the most expensive paintings. Not only how much they are worth, but the idea that 9 out of 10 of these paintings are modern art paintings. That's how popular modern art is today. And so even to get into the top 10, you need to be spending $165 million. And this is a Liechtenstein painting. Uh, Liechtenstein is more of a pop artist from the 1960s. Medigliani at $170 million. Picasso, 179. Mark Rothko, 186, 186 million dollars for this painting. Gustav Klimt, we'll talk about him during the art theft lecture. Getting into the top five, we have Jackson Pollock, 200 million. Here's Gauguin's work at 210 million. At a quarter of a billion dollars, Cezanne's card players. And Willem de Kooning, also an abstract expressionist, $300 million. And finally, the number one painting sold just two, a little bit over two years ago, is Salvador Mundi's uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. And we only attribute it to Leonardo da Vinci. We're not 100% sure he did it. It was sold for $400 million, but it says an extra $50 million because that is the buyer's premium that he's paying for the work. Post-Impressionism is also where we're going to find Vincent van Gogh. And again, I have a completely separate lecture on him, so I'm not going to spend time talking about him in this lecture. His most famous work, of course, Starry Night. Edward Monk who created the scream, he falls into this category because of his expressionist use of color. And of course, we love to make fun of this painting. He had a very sad and tragic life. A lot of his family members uh, died very, very young. And so he was always surrounded by death and such. Monk himself lived into his 80s. And now we're going to move into the 20th century. Just to recap and give you some rough years, we're looking at Impressionism from the 1860s to the 1880s, Post-Impressionism from the 1880s to the right around the turn of the century in the 1900s, Fauvism, 1903 to 1908. Now the leader of the Fauves is Henri Matisse. And the name itself, Fauvism, comes from the name Wild Beast. And what happens is, first of all, these paintings, I'm going to show you one of these paintings real quick here, and then I'll go back to the other slide. But you can see how bright and colorful, and maybe even using complementary colors here, and definitely arbitrary colors. These paintings are loud and exciting, they're fun. And you can imagine a room that is filled with them all over the walls. And what happens at the Fauvist exhibition is somebody wheels in this sculpture by the 15th century Italian sculptor Donatello. And there's an art critic in the room, his name is Vosilis, and he writes that Donatello is surrounded by wild beasts. The name Fauve stuck, and that's what we have today. As I just mentioned, we're using arbitrary color now. We first start to see that in Cezanne's work. And here, um, this is where uh, artists can use any color that they choose. The canvases I write down are raw and untreated, which means they're not first primed with a product like gesso to make the painting smoother or you know, more colorful in terms of reflective quality. But the works are first shown in the Salon d'Autumn in 1903. This is the Fall Salon. The normal salon that we talk about that takes place in France, like the Salon of 1863, for instance, that was so controversial, those salons take place in the springtime. 
So Dural was one of the other famous painters in this group, but we mostly look at Matisse because he's the, you know, by far the person we see in the history books. And even in this painting here, we can see the canvas through the paint. It's not even completely filled with paint. And again, very harsh, wide brush strokes. So there's Matisse there who painted in a, uh, or who I should say created art in a bunch of different mediums such as painting and sculpture. He created textiles and toward the end of his life he made cutouts. Our work here from the chapter on color about arbitrary color, the idea that that was based on a, a true uh, white background. This is one of his early paintings which hangs in one of the government houses in France today. And he was very much inspired by the works of Chardin. And in Chardin's work at the right, we can kind of see how the textile on the table, that tablecloth, is kind of pushed back off to the side. And Matisse kind of does the same thing with that textile that's on top of the cabinet. It is not centered correctly, and it kind of makes us want to go into the painting and straighten it out. This is another early work by Matisse. Everything's perfectly done, chiaroscuro and linear perspective. Again, a work purchased by the state government. And we go from Matisse's academic side to his avant-garde style, which of course is fauvism. So make sure to associate that term with these types of paintings. And look at what he does to the painting of his wife, this of her portrait. We have this work sometimes called Madame Matisse, but more commonly called the green stripe, where Matisse puts that green stripe down the center of her face. The person who bought this, Leo Stein, who is the brother of the famed author Gertrude Stein, said that this was, quote, the nastiest smear of paint he had ever seen, and he would need time to get used to looking at it. And there is Matisse and his wife there. I have never seen a picture of her smiling, and I can tell you um, that they did live apart for most of their married life. Matisse traveled extensively in North Africa during uh, the time where we had French colonies in Algiers and Morocco and such. And he would bring back these artifacts and include them into his paintings. So we've got the still life here um, done on an African prayer mat. And this really was a kind of a cool image because it again kind of reduces that idea of linear perspective we see that some of these objects on the mat itself, we don't know if they're part of the color scheme of the mat or if they're fruit on top of it. And Matisse loves to include sculpture he's working on in his paintings. So the sculpture of the couple off to the left is this sculpture here, who, which he just made. And when we get to this figure here, there's a lot of argument about it as to whether or not it is based on this figure, which was completed right about the same time. But I tend to argue that it's more relevant to this tamba, which is a funerary or reliquary figure that is found in the Congo. And with Matisse having made trips to North Africa, he most likely would have seen this image, and it is a little bit more geometric than his sculpture that he was creating. So I think it's based on this figure here at the right. Matisse, like many other modernist artists, contributed to the Russian ballets, or what were called the Ballet Russe, which were very popular in the early part of the 20th century. So you would have this modernist ballet led by the choreographer Leonid Massin, and then you'd have a modernist composer such as Igor Stravinsky, and then you'd have a modernist artist such as Matisse or Picasso or Durand, and they were charged with creating the sets, and they were also charged with creating the costume for these characters. 
These costumes are highly sought after. Many of them were destroyed in the bombings of London during World War II. So an artwork like this at the right easily sells for, or I should say it's insured for $300,000. Toward the end of Matisse's life, and I will tell you about this again when we get to the drawing lecture, is that Matisse began to develop arthritis so bad that he could not hold a paintbrush or a pencil in his hands. And so he could manipulate scissors, and that's what he would do the last four or five years of his life. He would create these cutouts, which are just construction paper painted in gouache. We have cubism next. And cubism is different because we have kind of co-leaders for this art movement. Picasso is normally assigned, but we also have to look at Georges Braque helping to evolve this art movement. This is where we take organic objects and transform them into their geometric equivalents. And basically, this is abstracting an object. A lot of times we'll see the color muted, but sometimes it can also be enhanced. And we continue to flatten the pictorial plane. So we've all seen this painting before when we talked about abstraction. So not only is it our first abstract painting, it is also our first cubist painting. And artists such as George Brock exclaimed that this painting, seeing it, was like drinking kerosene and being able to spit fire. Other artists were not as supporting of it, such as Matisse. He said that, or he literally threatened to break off his friendship with Picasso over that painting. Georges Braque was a Fauvist painter in the camp of Matisse, but once seeing Picasso's work joined him, and they, of course, co-led Cubism. Houses at Lestoc shows us a hillside community in France where these homes have now been changed to their geometric equivalents, cubes and then pyramids for their roofs. Look at the rectilinear line that now makes up the trees. And of course, we talked about the muting of color. We also have the elimination of linear perspective continuing to take hold in these paintings, and they do appear very, very flat. What is exciting about cubism during this time is it is about the breakdown of time and space, seeing the entire object basically unfolded in front of us. And so we don't have that time period where we're turning the object over. We're seeing basically all planes of it at the same time. The same can be said for Einstein's theory of relativity, which came out only two years before Cubism did. And I think it's fascinating that even though Picasso and Einstein never met, they still worked on the same principles of the theory of relativity. Also with the painting at the left called Ma Jolie, this is the first time we see words written on the surface of a painting. Painting used to be about communication and now the communication is failing. And so we have to have words to explain to us what's going on. I'll show you just a few other types of cubist paintings here. New Descending a Staircase by Duchamp. This is a cubist painting. And cubism also had a spin-off. In Italy, we have futurism. And futurism is so cool and so unique because it's the first time we have an art movement that is powered by a manifesto. And that's written by Filippo Marinetti. And I will put uh, a link or I'll put a PDF file on the Canvas site now. It's no longer titanium. But um, I'll, you should read it. It's only about three pages and you can always find it online as well. It is a really uh, fun manifesto to read. Futurists were into power, speed, mechanization, violence, and absolutely war. The futurists do get to meet Picasso, 
And there's Filippo Marinetti there. He called himself the caffeine of Europe. As I mentioned, the futurists do get to meet Picasso and uh, hang out with him in his studio in 1912. In the manifesto, they write that a car is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. And the idea of futurism is that they love mechanization. And so we have a 1909 Italian race car at the left. That's when futurism begins comparing itself to a 2000 year old sculpture that sits atop the grand staircase of the Louvre, very classical in its representation. You can see that this painting is very similar to cubism in terms of its fractured forms and seeing the object from different sides at the same time. However, we also have the element of dynamism and that's what futurism does is it brings in this almost motion element to paintings and other static devices such as sculpture. And so we have this group of people walking around from the upper left hand side, walking around the front of the train and kind of exiting the far right hand side. This is what they're able to do with sculpture. And here they're slowing down the shutter speed on the camera to capture the movements. And this is really the perfect manifestation of a futurist painting where we have a very modernist point of view as we're looking down upon this train. It is armor plated. We have snipers on the top. We have the fractured space around the train. And we also have some great addition of arbitrary color. And of course, the idea is this is very much warlike and Severini would even watch trains heading to the front of the war. And uh, this was a, a very much a common subject matter for him. Giacomo Bala, and we looked at his work earlier as well when we talked about motion, was a little bit older than the rest of the futurists by about 10 years. And he did not live in Rome like all of the others did. He lived up in Milan. His works are a lot less focus toward violence and war. Sadly though, futurism ends very abruptly in 1914 to 1915 because of the beginning of World War I. This is the first time we have a war that utilizes trench warfare and poison gas, tanks and airplanes. It's a horrific war in that 10 million people are killed and another 25 million are injured during the war. And this is really where we have the genesis of plastic surgery, because these are horrific injuries that these soldiers are sustaining. It is said that no single event has influenced the development of modern art as profoundly as World War I. And besides the invention of photography, I would have to agree with this statement. What you have is the leading abstract artists, such as Picasso, reverting back to painting imagery that is representational, very much in the style of Michelangelo. You have the artist Durand, who was a famous Fauvist artist. He stops painting altogether and says that after the war, I just think don't think anyone would have been interested in art any longer. But art does recover, and we do have our very first art movement post-World War I, and this is called Dada. The name itself is unique because it means different things in different languages. Somehow in French, this allegedly translates into hobby horse. But in Russian, Dada means yes, yes. In Romanian, it means no, no. And of course, in English, it sounds kind of like baby talk. Dada is also unique because it emerges from different cities at the same time. It emerges from Zurich and New York, Berlin and Paris, and each of them has their own unique style. Tristan Zara is the one who wrote the Dada Manifesto, and the main statement in that manifesto is that Dada means nothing. We used to argue, and now we're 
50 years past Luncheon on the Grass by Manet, but we used to argue about this painting in terms of the idea of what is the correct way to paint. Visible brush strokes, size of the painting for the subject matter, should we use linear perspective or not? Now we're asking a much deeper question as to what art is. In Zurich, we have these masks being created by Marcel Janco, or Hugo Ball reciting a sound poem. Over in Berlin, we have Hannah Hock creating these wonderful photo montages. Over in New York, we have this work by Man Ray. And we also see photography. But Paris is really, again, where we're most concerned with during this modern age. Marcel Duchamp, the one who gave us new Descending a Staircase, this is the person who is the most active Dada artist. Today we study him mostly because of the theory behind his artworks. This is a person who was Hungarian by birth, spent many years in Paris, and then later immigrated to the United States. He's going to die in the 1960s, but he lives in California, and particularly um, he lived around the Pasadena area. He is famous for ready-mades, and he was also a cross-dresser. So we started off with Nude Descending a Staircase when he was a Cubist artist. We talked about motion. We talked about this work also during the motion lecture. It's our very first work of kinetic art. Duchamp is also responsible for that work. This is called an assisted ready-made because he's taking two objects and just transforming them lightly. But the ready-made is the idea that we have a transformation of commonly manufactured objects into works of art. The artist has been bypassed and we don't have craftsmanship anymore. It is a full on assault of the artistic tradition. The idea now that we have attacked role number two of the roles of the artist by creating photography. Now we're looking at role number four, which is creating beauty and beauty seems to be a miss. So in advance of the broken arm is simply a snow shovel that Duchamp bought from a hardware store. But the most famous work and the one you're gonna be responsible for on the final exam is Fountain. This is a urinal on its side and Duchamp brought it in to an art exhibit and paid the entrance fee, but it was then removed and Duchamp goes about writing about this instance in a magazine called The Blind Man, and he calls it the Richard Mutt case, because as you can see on the side of that urinal is the initial R and then the last name of Mutt, and this is a take on the manufacturers of the urinal's name. So they say that any artist paying $6 may exhibit, and Mr. Richard Mutt sent in a fountain. Without discussion, this article disappeared and never was exhibited. What were the grounds for refusing Mr. Mutt's fountain? Some contend that it was immoral and vulgar. Others say it was plagiarism, a plain piece of plumbing. In regards to it being immoral or vulgar, that is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It is a fixture that you see every day in a plumber's store window. But what's important for us is that the idea of plagiarism. And he says that whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. The idea is that he chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. So that is gonna be extremely important, the idea that the idea 
is more important than the artwork itself. And this is going to lead us on into performance art. It's going to lead us on into contemporary art, which is post-1945 or post-World War II art. And now let's move on to surrealism. And surrealism is really cool because when you consider all the other modern art movements, this one is going to last over the longest amount of time. Futurism, about five years. Same thing with fauvism. But surrealism begins in the 1920s and goes all the way to the 1950s. Unlike Renaissance artists who thought artistic talent was God-given, the surrealists believed that the talent or inspiration for art came from their subconscious, driven by impulses, desires, and fears. In their works, we see a juxtaposition, a tension between interior and exterior, conscious and unconscious, dream and reality. The leader of the Surrealists, and although you probably don't know his name, this is the guy who wrote the Surrealist Manifesto, André Breton. And like Filippo Marinetti, this guy was mostly a writer and a poet rather than an artist. The Surrealist Manifesto in its original form is about 47 pages in length. However, he knew that this was too long and wrote the second Surrealist Manifesto. That one is only around 20 pages long. What's great to me about Surrealism is that we're also looking at art that can be representational or art that can be abstract, where in Cubism, all you have is abstract works. I'm going to go through some of the more famous Surrealist artists, such as Max Ernst. This is the gentleman who gave us Frotage, and if we um, think back, this is going to be from the Pattern and Texture lecture, where we're rubbing on a textured surface to create the basis for an artwork. We have this great kind of half painting, half collage of two children threatened by a nightingale, but we also have three children in this image plus a, a gentleman, and we have that juxtaposition, as I was mentioning, of being not only inside the painting, but also that gentleman on top of a shed reaching out to the doorknob that's in our world. We also have the idea of, with this person absconding with a small child, we're not sure whether he's trying to save her or cause harm to her. Salvador Dali, of course, is the name that we think of synonymous with surrealism. But surrealism was very much like a club. You could join, you could get kicked out, all sorts of things. And Salvador Dali was kicked out of the surrealist movement in 1936. I'm going to show you a few of his most famous works, of course. This one, his most famous, The Persistence of Memory. This one I've always liked. I, I don't know why, but it's just that giraffe and the distance on fire is pretty amazing. One of my students turned me on to this work where the swans in the pond reflect as elephants. Salvador Dali is in this painting off to the left. Rene Magritte, he's most famous for this is not a pipe image, letting us know or reminding us that this is a painting. It's very similar to this work here where we've got the French word for sky at the right, and then a painting of the sky at the left. The Menaced Assassins is a great artwork to write some type of essay on, creative writing project, because it is so confusing, because we have to establish which of these individuals is good and which of them is bad. And when we make a statement about that, for instance, the individuals outside the room on either side, if they're good, 
that means the person inside the room is bad. But these people with the club and the net might be bad, which means the person inside is good. Either way, we still have a dead body. We don't know whether that person who's listening to the Victrola is leaving or arriving. We have those strange figures outside the window peering in. So it is a very unique work. And Magritte would go through the history of art and take some of these famous works, and the one at the left is by Manet, and he places all the individuals in coffins. Surrealism is where I would also place Frida Kahlo. And even Picasso, though he didn't know he was a member of the Surrealists, Andre Breton told him that he was. And of course, Girl Before a Mirror is very much in the Surrealist style. And we'll talk about Picasso in his own lecture later on in the semester. This is where I'm also putting Merritt Oppenheim's object here. Uh, again, this is from the pattern and texture lecture where this is subversive texture. And the whole idea of modern art is that it takes place in Europe. We start in 1863 with the luncheon on the grass painting and we end in the 1930s and 40s with surrealism. When we look over to America and to see what we're doing, it's not that impressive. We have paintings like this, you know, very plain and boring, very realist images. And this is the time where we have the American regionalist painters at their most famous. People like Grant Wood, Andrew Wyeth, and probably the favorite of most people, Edward Hopper. One of the great works by Hopper is House by the Railroad. And I say this because I'm a huge fan of the movie Psycho. And Alfred Hitchcock saw this painting. He was a fan of Hopper's as well. And he based the Psycho House on this painting. So at the end of World War II, Europe is destroyed and a lot of artists have immigrated to America, and a lot of artworks have been taken here for safekeeping. And so what emerges in 1945 is the very first American art movement, Abstract Expressionism. Jackson Pollock is going to be the leader of this movement, and what's happened is this has completed our arc. With Impressionism, we started off with representational art. By the time we got to Cubism, we had abstraction. And now we have what's called non-objective art. Art that does not have a subject matter. So again, representational art, abstract art, and non-objective art. So the foremost critic of abstract expressionism was Clement Greenberg. This is the guy who put the abstract expressionist artists on the map because when this art first came out, no one really understood it. And so he comes up with the language of formalism, which is basically what we've been studying over the first part of this course, is the formal elements, line, shape, and color. The most famous abstract expressionists would be like Jackson Pollock, Make sure you know him and be able to identify his work for the exam. And Vince's famous drip paintings. Lee Krasner is Jackson Pollock's wife. And we really have her to thank for as famous as Jackson Pollock is because he could never have done it by himself with all the things that were challenging him both mentally and physically, um, this is the person who really managed 
his career, and unfortunately she doesn't quite get the credit for it that she really deserves. Their friend Willem de Kooning, and of course his famous image of a woman at the right. This is probably the most famous painting in the early 1950s, and a lot of people did take offense at the representation of it. Um, however, he said that this is just a contemporary way of viewing a woman. It's not unlike these ancient prehistoric sculptures of women, or in this case, a Renaissance model, or even a 1940s pinup. These are all different ways of representing a woman. His later career uh, paintings looked like this. Unfortunately, he did pass away from Alzheimer's in the early 1990s. And then we have Mark Rothko, who also creates these very non-objective types of paintings. He considers these landscape scenes. And it is amazing how expensive they are when they sell at auction. I'm going to show you an auction in just a moment here. But the sad end to his life is he that he committed suicide around 1970, 1971. And he had moved into his studio and his studio assistant found him. But his paintings went from this very bright color to a much darker color right before his death. So I do want to show you an auction uh, real quick. Lot 20 is next. The Mark Rothko, orange, red, yellow from 1961. The big Rothko showing on the screen there and is illustrated and described in your catalogs. And $24 million starts. $24 million now at $24 million, $25 million, $26 million, at $26, $27 million, $28 million, $29 million, $30 million, $31 million, $32 million, $33 million. Mark's bidder, $34 million, $35 million, $36 million with Loic, $37 million against you, Loic, at $37, $40 million. Amy's bidder at $40 million. Four of you in a huddle there at $40 million. $41? Two. $42 million. Mark's bidder now at $42 million. At 43 million with Amy now, at 43 million dollars against you, Mark. At 43, 44 million. Mark Spitter at 44 million now. At 44 million dollars with Mark at 44 million. At 44 million dollars, Mark Spitter 45 million, 46 million, still against you, Amy. At 46 million dollars. At 46 million now. Mark Spitter at 46, against you, Amy, at 46 million, against the room, 46 million, 500,000, spirited bid there at 46 million, five, 47 million, with Mark at 47 million, against you, Brett, and against you, Amy, at 47 million dollars, 40 mil 47 million, 500,000, against you, Mark, 48 million, at 48 million dollars, at 48 million with Mark still, against the two of you. At 48 million, against you, Brett. 48 million, 500,000, 49 million. At 49 million dollars, still with Mark. At 49 million, 49 million, 500,000, against you, Mark. 50 million, Yussi's bidder, he got there first. At 50 million, ahead of you, 51 million, Mark's bidder. At 51 million now, 52 million, with Yussi, 53 million. Mark Spitter at 53, 54 million, 55 million, at 55 million dollars, still 56 million, 60 million, at 60 million dollars. What will you give me, Yussi, 70? 62 million, at 62 million dollars, 63 million. Mark Spitter at 63, 64 million, 65 million, 66 million, 67 million, 68 million, with Yussi at 68 against you, Mark, at 
69 million. Who's that? Brett? Brett. Ah. <laughs> At $69 million, Brett Spitter now. $70 million. At $70 million with you, see now. At $70 million. Against you, Brett, against you, Mark. $71 million. At $71 million. With Brett, $72 million. At $72 million now. With you, see at $72, against you, Brett, and against you, Mark. At $72 million. 72 million, five, Brett just got there first. 73, Mark Spitter at 73 million. At 73 million dollars. With Mark at 73 million now. 74 million, what's that, 75 million? 75 million. Yossi Spitter at 75 million now. At 75 million dollars, Yossi Spitter at 75 million. It's against you, Mark, at 75 million and against you, Brett, at 75 million dollars now. Yussi's bidder. Against you, Mark. What will you give me? At $75 million. $75 million, 500,000. With Brett, at $75 million, 500,000. It's against you, you see, at $75 million, 76 million. At $76 million. At 76 now. Yussi's bidder still at $76 million. It's against you, Brett. Against you, Mark. 76 million, 500,000. Against you, you'll see. It's 76 million, five now. At 76 million, 500,000. One more. At 76 million, 500,000. The bid's with Brett. It's Mark, at 76 million, five. Against your bidder. At 76 million five, it's with Brett and selling. Anyone this side? At 76 million five. Fair warning now. With Brett, not yours, Mark. 77 million, even though he's out. At 77 million. At 77 million dollars. Against you, Brett. At 77 million. At 77 million dollars. Yussi's bidder at 77 million. Against you, Brett. And against you, Mark, at $77 million. Fair warning now, at $77 million. Not yours, Brett. Not yours, Mark. It's with you, see, at $77 million. At $77 million. Now you're in again, at $77 million. Give me $78. At $77 million. Now. At $77 million. With Brett. I see it at 77 million five. At 77 million five hundred thousand. The bid is with Brett. It is against you, you see. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll believe you. At 77 million five and selling to Brett Spitter, foul warning, all done at 77 million five hundred thousand. <laughs> Brett Spitter at 77 million five. So again, it's incredible to see how much these works truly sell for. Other abstract expressionists would be like Barnett Newman and his famous Zip paintings. Even though his paintings are a little bit plain, uh, he was a fantastic sculptor. And the, this is one of three that he made to memorialize Martin Luther King Jr. Ad Reinhardt, And what do you do when you go to a museum and you have this on the wall? I mean, it's really incredible to think that a museum would display this, purchase this. This guy had to Google what the heck he was looking at. These people seem to love it. I didn't. And then just to uh, show you again how large these canvases that these artists are working on are, most of them had to work with them positioned on the ground. 
Helen Frankenthaler was the last of the abstract expressionists to pass away. She died in 2011, and up to the very end, she was lecturing throughout the United States on college campuses. And she creates kind of a, a Pollock-like painting, but she mixes her paint with paint thinner. So it is absorbed by the canvas instead of laying on top, and it becomes more of a stain. And so while she's creating the overall idea, we still have some of the painting left up to chance as it soaks into the fabric. And even though her paintings are very non-objective, they do have very representational names. And Morris Lewis, who lets gravity take hold to create his artworks. And he's a kind of unique individual. He did not work in New York like the other artists we've just seen. He worked down in Washington, D.C. And not even his wife saw him paint. He painted out in a shed in the backyard. And this is a completely staged photo for a magazine shoot. And this one is quite pretty. It is, um, the way he made this, was he took the canvas without stretcher bars on it and kind of rolled it like a funnel and then poured the paint in the center of the funnel. And that is gonna be our last image for this presentation on modern art.